Welcome to Cryptocurrencies, the future of digital money show at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. Today, we are welcoming back to the show Mr. Bitcoin himself, Mr. Tone Vays. Tone is a cryptocurrency expert. He is a brilliant investor and a notorious Bitcoin trader within the cryptocurrency space. Tone worked on Wall Street for over 10 years. He became involved in cryptocurrency in 2013. He's a very popular commentator and show host on Bitcoin, economics, privacy and freedom. We're thrilled to have him here to talk about our current political situation and how it is or could affect Bitcoin. Tone, welcome back to the show. How are you today? I'm good. Hey, Michelle. Glad to be back on. It's been a while, probably a year at least. I know. I know. We have to keep having you on more like every three to four months now that things are really starting to change. It looks like they're starting to pick up a little speed. Tone, let's start off, though, with the politics of Bitcoin. Oh, my gosh. Today is Thursday, as we are taping. It is November the 12th, 2020. And our November 3rd elections are in the middle of lawsuits and an avalanche of fraud and confusion. And it looks like this is just the beginning. So let's start off with your thoughts about the whole situation. Sure. Uh, The election has been absolutely crazy. I've been on record for years that Trump was going to get reelected in a landslide. Uh, He would win even more states than he did against Hillary Clinton uh, in 2016. And uh, while going into the election, the betting market still had uh, Biden as a favorite. Uh, Going into around 8 p.m., it was looking like Trump was going to take all of those states, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Georgia, uh, North Carolina, uh, even Arizona and uh, and Nevada uh, should have gone all in Trump's favor. And then on a dime, it all flipped. And I still don't understand it. Uh, and it looks really, really bad for America. Uh, I'm now covering the politics a little bit more. Um, from a Bitcoin perspective, um, it doesn't matter which candidate wins. Bitcoin is in a bull market. And either way, uh, Bitcoin will succeed. Uh, and, it will, and I think Bitcoin will do very well over the next year or two uh, back to new all-time highs. Uh, it's an easy statement to say now, but you know, earlier this year when we were crashing, it certainly wasn't. So Bitcoin will be fine. Uh, now, the greatest thing for Bitcoin is a complete... Uh, disaster in the outcome. Like if this battle continues and we don't actually know who's president going into January, that will now start to cause the confidence of the US dollar. Uh, And another thing I've been saying for a long time on my channel is that hyperinflation is a political event. It's not a too much printing of the currency event. It didn't matter that the US government printed 22% of all its currency God knows how many trillions of dollars in 2020. That's not what's going to cause hyperinflation. They can print twice as much next year, and that doesn't have to cause hyperinflation as long as there is political and economic stability, or relatively speaking. But if the confidence of the U.S. political system is lost, not only by the U.S. citizens, but also by uh, those around the world, then it doesn't matter if they print any money at all. If confidence in your uh, politics and your currency is lost by the world, your currency goes into hyperinflation with absolutely no printing because nobody wants your currency and they will all sell it at 10 cents on the dollar because they don't want it. They would rather hold the Euro, they would rather hold the Venezuelan currency uh, if uh, if there is that kind of a breakdown in uh, confidence of the US dollar because uh, half the world or the majority of the world thinks that one side actually cheated to win an election. Uh, This is something that is usually usually happens in uh, former, you know, like banana republics, but in the US, this was unexpected. Now, I am not necessarily, my opinion on whether there was cheating or wasn't cheating is kind of irrelevant. I, of course, have my opinion, and I'm happy to share that opinion, whether there was or wasn't fraud involved. But regardless of my opinion, uh, the fact that 
the world will believe that fraud was involved goes is like the biggest leap forward to take down the US dollar as the world reserve currency. Because the only thing that matters to a fiat currency is confidence by the people in the stability of the government that prints that currency. And if that confidence is shaken, that's it. This is how the US dollar loses its supremacy. It's not about the printing of the dollar. Wow. This is such a scary time. And, you know, from my perspective, I mean, this is such blatant, despicable lies and fraud on behalf of people. I mean, and the mainstream media does not report the truth. So people are like, what fraud? Fraud where? You know, prove the fraud. We don't see any fraud. You know, 8 million ballots were confiscated coming into the country at the port of LA coming from China that were printed by, <laughs> by the CCP, by the Chinese Communist Party, 8 million. And we have no idea how many were not caught. You know, there were over 130,000 ballots that were counted with the name Jane Doe on them. It's like somebody just said, well, put Jane Doe, whatever. And then somebody literally took them literally and put Jane Doe. I mean, it's such a farce. Um, and that's not even to mention the software that, you know, has been caught, you know, flipping, you know, just Trump to Biden one way, you know, hundreds of thousands of votes. I mean, this is extraordinary. And then we have a man tottering up to the mic tone. He looks like he's going to fall over. He's incoherent. You know, his policy is 60% tax rate upon wealthy people. Like they're going to stay in the United States. Oh, you're going to tax me 60%. Sure, I'll settle down. Of course, they're going to leave. You know, we're going to lose all of our wealth, all of our companies. And, um, and you know, this isn't even to mention tone. We've got huge fraud that's clear. And we've got this candidate that has accused of um, huge fraud with foreign nations in the hundreds of millions of dollars three weeks ago. I mean, what is happening here? I just... I, I, I see you are well up to date and everything you just said is maybe 5% of all of the bad stuff that is happening. Like you would need an entire day to list it. Forget explaining it. And that's what makes it so crazy, uh, the levels of this. And you are right. I don't see how Biden can last four years, he, but he has to last two years. Uh, he can't uh, hand off the presidency to Kamala in less than two years, because if he can last two years, somehow that opens up the door for her to be president for 10 years, because then she can rerun twice. And considering that, uh, yeah, because if she takes over next year, then she can only get reelected once. But if she uh, is president for less than two years, she can then run uh, two more times if she keeps getting reelected. And the problem is it's a bad precedent because if they can, if, if, if um, again, I don't want to show my bias that I think that they cheated, but they obviously cheated. Uh, but if they can get away with it so easily, they're going to do it again and again and again. And pretty soon they may not even have to do it uh, because I've been so critical of California and the people of California that have screwed up their own state with these socialist agendas and socialist bills and laws that now all of them are leaving California. They've already taken over Colorado. They're taking over Nevada. They're taking over Arizona. And do you see how close that Texas vote was? Like, it's almost scary. Like, I'm not sure what is scarier at this moment, whether the blatant cheating that got Biden in or the fact that the country may have actually voted him in legitimately. Like, I'm not sure which is the scarier thing, because if the Californians, uh, if enough Californians migrate over into Texas, and I think that's going to happen over the next eight years, that's it. If Texas goes blue, there will never be another Republican president ever again. This is just... Yeah, you're right. I mean, it's like a mass exodus of California to every place else. Oh, we hate it here. We've got to move. We've got to move. But they don't move and then become, you know, Texans. They stay <laughs> right. Californians and keep doing what they're doing. They just hate California now. So let's move to Texas and keep doing what we're doing. And 
you're, you know, in Nevada and Utah and, and the Western half of the country, basically, they consider the Midwest to be too boring to come to. <laughs> you know? well, thank God. <laughs> I mean, it's like the like, one place. Like, I mean, like Colo Colorado was a traditional Republican state and they didn't even have a shot. It was like assumed Democrat from day one. And uh, because all the Californians like moved there once they legalized uh, cannabis. And uh, yeah, they legalized cannabis, but now that state is going to ruin the rest of the country with voting uh, this way. It's, uh, it, it, it's kind of crazy and it's a little scary. And uh, my family immigrated to the U.S. from the Soviet Union. So I am a little more critical of the socialist system than most. And a lot of people say, well, socialist systems aren't bad, uh, but that's because I don't want to use the C word. I don't want to use the word communist systems, uh, but uh, that's where they lean to. Uh, my family, uh, having immigrated from, uh, from Soviet Russia, uh, my parents would never vote for a Democrat ever. Uh, they never have, and they never will, uh, just because of where they came from. And me, uh, studying in U.S. schools through uh, middle school and then high school and then uh, seven years in universities because I have several degrees, uh, you do have that huge liberal bias. And when I uh, became of voting age, uh, you know, one of the first uh, vo couple of votes that I casted were for Democrats. And my parents were not happy about that at all. And they saw that as the influence of the U.S. education system. Uh, it takes, a, you know, it takes almost a decade to grow out of it. Like as much time as you've been educated by uh, the U.S. Uh, system uh, through high school and universities, it will take you exactly that much amount of time to get yourself into the proper thinking uh, as to what those systems lead to in the future. And it is kind of scary. That's so interesting because um, the, the very educational systems that are supposed to teach history, you know, instead sway people toward, I don't know, preferences, you know, um, this is what you should be. This is, you know, socialism in the, the whole socialism embraces everyone. Socialism is, you know, the charitable way to go because everyone gets, you know, a base income and everyone is included and how could you leave anyone out and you're heartless if you aren't when the reality of socialism is and you know who who leads the way town are these people in hollywood there is no more capitalist economy or capitalist industry than hollywood on the face of the planet you know and yet here they are socialism socialism yes you know now you know does anybody have a director job for me you know it's complete you know it's just complete for they don't they know they're influencing millions of people you they know they're changing the lives of people who need you know capitalism they also defund the police these whole crazy concepts you know how someone can be at a party or tweet defund the police, we'll vote Democrat, you know, because that's the agenda. Uh, when they are fortunate and they have their career and they have no consideration at all for, say, the 83-year-old grandma at two o'clock in the morning who can't afford to live anywhere else, who has the drug dealer four doors down breaking in her window at 3 a.m., who is she supposed to call when some idiot actor or director is virtue signaling and gets their whole police department defunded? They don't know what they're doing to people. Right. right. Look, I'm all for police being held more accountable. Uh, but defunding them is not going to make that better. Uh, defunding them will only give those jobs to people that care even less, uh, not to mention uh, less money to actually train the police properly. So I don't like the whole defund the police narrative, but uh, there are way bigger battles to fight. Uh, I think if you're going to start to fight battles, uh, it should be uh stop enforcing victimless crimes you know focus on actual crimes more 
And yeah, maybe uh, spend the money more, wise, uh, more wisely with the police to give them proper training and actually fire people that are bad at their job. Don't wait for them to do something catastrophic. Right. Because a lot of times when a police officer uh, does something that's really, really egregious, uh, usually they had a record uh, that it should have been seen coming. So I think that uh, one of the problems with a lot of uh, jobs, especially in government, like this doesn't apply to the private sector. Like in the private sector, uh, you don't just keep a bad employees because uh, it looks bad or because they have seniority or because, you know, it's a friend of a friend. Uh, no, you get fired. And that is one of the problems with the public sector is that your job is too secure and uh, too much favoritism. It's like, you know, oh, the cops uh, let things go if you're a fireman and vice versa. And it shouldn't be that way. Uh, that's one of the problems that I see. So uh, if that is a little more cleaned up, uh, I think it would be much better. Everything needs reform from time to time, not just police officers, accountants, people that deal with money, bankers, all the way across the court. Every profession has its bad apples, and but you don't defund the police. I see that as a bigger picture tone, I think. Do you remember when Obama was in and Chicago supposedly was going so crazy and the Chicago police couldn't handle it, who are some of the toughest people in the world, but supposedly they couldn't handle it. And they were talking about calling in the UN to police Chicago. Do you remember that? I don't remember that specifically, but I'm not surprised because Chicago has been a mess. Yeah. Uh, Chicago has been a complete mess for a long time. Illinois has been a mess for a long time. Uh, it's like the worst pension funding system. Uh, it's uh, Illinois is a big mess. And uh, uh, hey, if, they, if you keep voting for the same people, you're going to only get worse and worse and worse. Like, what else can I tell you? And, you know, just to wrap up that thought, there's, here's my thought, and I want to hear what your thought is here on this. Um, the UN police, and I was talking to somebody who turned out to be from Chicago. This is on a completely random subject, but she was from Chicago. And at that time, I was like, oh, did you hear they wanted to call in the UN police? And she was like, oh, they should. I was like, they should. What do you mean? She's like, she goes, well, the UN police are like, you know, the top. They're like the blue seals or the NC, you know, she was even saying the seals, were, you know, they're like the top police in the world. Tone, these are third world army soldiers who they don't speak English. They're, they're, people should look up who are the UN police. These are not top notch in the world Americans. These are people who, don't speak English, hate Americans, consider us to be ignorant and selfish, and therefore they will have the power on the street to arrest you if you look at them wrong. And that is an invasion of our country. And I really think that that whole defund the police so that we don't have any more police. So if anything were to go crazy, they have to bring in the UN. And within two or three years, our country would be basically policed by people who don't even speak our language and who are overseen by the UN. That's what I think. That's what I'm scared of when it comes to this defund the police. I mean, I don't think that's coming. Uh, well, certainly not under Trump, but uh, there's not, the not under Trump. Trump was our he's our safety. OK, go on. Sorry. It's uh, yeah, I don't want to be. Look, Trump has his flaws as well. Uh, but the way I defend Trump is he's not a politician. And by not being a politician, he cares a lot more about America than he does about a global general agenda on a million different things. And I'm not here to talk about conspiracy theories of a global agenda, but um, uh, every single country, it, especially in Europe, wants to outsource, like you said, their laws and the and, uh, uh, enforcement of those laws to a higher authority, not within the country. And that kind of opens up for, we can do whatever we want uh, because you have granted your authority to a master that's not of your own country. And you don't want to see America go that way at all uh, because I'm not sure where uh, to actually go if America just uh, submits itself to a EU government uh, who does want to take over the world these days. And, uh, you know, China wants to take over its uh, uh, former territories like Hong Kong, for example. And uh, that's it. There's not much uh, 
not, not, not many, many places to go for some freedom these days. And it's, uh, it's rough. It's yeah. rough. Uh, I mean, uh, for me, the vote for Trump is a vote is an anti-political political vote. That's how I refer to it on Twitter. Uh, like, I'm not, I hate the Republicans almost as much as I hate the Democrats. But my vote was not for the Republicans. My vote was specifically for Trump. I usually vote independent, uh, though that candidate will never win. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm a very conservative green, by the way. I'm not a Republican or a, a Democrat because I agree with you. I think they're both one and the same, but um, this is a very scary time. Let's switch back to Bitcoin. When um, the smoke starts to clear here, I think you talked about this just a little bit, but does it matter which party wins? Um, why or why not? No, it completely doesn't matter which party wins uh, uh, for a couple of reasons. One of them is uh, Bitcoin has just gone through a multi-year bear market. Uh, we topped at 20,000 all the way back in 2017. And we're almost going into 2021. And we're finally back in that vicinity of 20,000. It's that time. Bitcoin moves in, in these... Uh, three to four year cycles because of an event called the halving, where every four years, uh, the new supply of Bitcoin gets cut in half. So uh, by design, uh, Bitcoin it was invented to continuously rise in price if Bitcoin continued to be useful to the world, to society. As more and more people adopt Bitcoin, uh, as its uh, new supply, it shrinks greatly, it has no other choice but to rise in value. And it tends to go uh, up in value a little too much and comes down in these bear markets. But the bear market has ended. Uh, the bear market ended earlier this year with that big drop around COVID. And we've gone up uh, from around 4,000 in March all the way to 16,000 today. And I think we're I don't want to say we're getting started, uh, but we're maybe at the best in the middle. Uh, and I do think over the next year and a half to two years, we can see uh, all time highs get crushed. Uh, I'm not going to give crazy expectations like $100,000 Bitcoin by end of next year. I do believe that it's possible. Uh, I'm going to be more conservative. I'm going to say my target is a $45,000 Bitcoin sometime by the end of 2021 or sometime in 2022. Uh, and it doesn't matter who the president is uh, because people are realizing how valuable Bitcoin is with its properties. Uh, I'll mention them one more time. I'm sure I've said it many times. I'm wearing one of these properties on my shirt. It's called <laughs> Unconfiscatable. It's actually, the, I, I own the domain as well. I have a conference by that name uh, that takes place in Las Vegas. And uh, Bitcoin is the first asset a human has ever owned that cannot be taken away from, from him by force because no one has to know you have Bitcoin. A little harder for some of us that are publicly speaking about it, but for an average person that is able to keep their mouth shut, that they can store as much wealth as they like in Bitcoin and no one has to know they have it. And then no one would be able to force them uh, to give it up. Uh, that's property number one, and I feel is the most important property. And this hasn't happened as often uh, in the last 50 years, but certainly during uh, the great wars of the early 20th century, if you had to get out of your country, and how do you take your wealth with you? Uh, Bitcoin now provides that option. Uh, the second property is censorship-resistant value transfer, just the ability to send uh, something of value to anyone, anywhere in the world, without anyone in between stopping it from getting there is absolutely powerful. Uh, sure, it's not always gonna be fast and it may not always be cheap and it may not always be private, but it will get there. Uh, and the fact that no government entity can stop you from doing it is insanely powerful. And the third property is hard money. There will only be 21 million Bitcoin. Because if 21 million Bitcoin is altered or challenged, that means the first two properties no longer hold. 
That means Bitcoin is not unconfiscatable and Bitcoin is not censorship resistant uh, if that property is changed. And that property is what uh, drives the price of Bitcoin higher because there's a limited supply. So it's one of those things where the time has come once again for people to realize how powerful and useful Bitcoin is. And as this uh, election results play out, it becomes more and more important. And I do agree with you, more and more people are going to leave the country and um, not even necessarily for taxes. Uh, yeah, taxes is gonna, are going to get completely, uh, I mean, by, if Biden is president, uh, taxes will rise significantly and more people will be interested in leaving for tax purposes. But even outside of tax purposes, uh, people like myself are very concerned uh, about the future of the country and its political direction. It's too late for my parents to go anywhere. They're in their 70s. But when my parents left Russia, they were my age. And uh, uh, I know at least one of my parents will completely understand uh, if I get the hell out of Dodge because of what's happening here. Uh, hopefully they both will. Uh, but yeah, now there is actual reason to leave for political reasons. Everyone was pondering before. People were like, if Trump becomes president, I'm leaving the country. If Obama becomes president, I'm leaving the country. And most of that is bullshit. Mm -hmm. uh, people were leaving for political reasons. But this time around, not only is it obvious that there is this socialist agenda, they might have cheated to get it. And if that's not a red flag, that's more important than taxes. I don't know what is. It's huge. It's huge. We are the reserve currency of the world. You know, barely. I mean, it, you know, it's, we've been talked about for, you know, at least the past decade or so. I mean, are we even trustworthy. <laughs> well, apparently not. <laughs> you know? And um, cheating in your own domestic election, when you are supposed to be the gold standard and example for the world, it just shows you the, how, uh, basically, here's what it means to me. Uh, the ends justify the means and the means don't matter. Uh, that's what it tells me when the U.S. Uh, potentially, and somewhat obviously, cheated to get a result in, uh, just because everybody hates Trump. Uh, and it's, it's incredible. Uh, and one, one other thing, a lot of people are now saying that Trump should just, you know, uh, call it quits. Uh, it's and embarrassing, this you're not conceding because we cheated. <laughs> right. And, um, and people are trying to compare this to the, to the cheating in 2016, uh, which is insane, or the cheating in 2000, which is also somewhat insane. So I just want to clear those two up. Let's go to 2000. In 2000, I personally don't believe there was, um, look, every side wants to cheat a little bit. Uh, the, the, this year was taken to like, 100x level, but every side cheats a little bit. But what happened to uh, from my uh, memory in 2000, it wasn't until after it was realized that Florida is so close and it needed a recount, the favorable Republican governor, who happens to be the brother of one of the people in question, happened to stall the process enough and delay the process enough. And, you know, fudge some lines a little bit to keep this guy president. Do I think Al Gore won that election and should have been president? Yes. But do I think that the Republicans cheated before uh, people were going to the voting booth? I don't believe they did. I believe they cheated a little bit after the fact because they found a way to make that situation in their favor. What happened four years ago is nowhere near the same. First of all, I don't believe anything happened four years ago, but let's assume that it did. I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt and say that Russia somehow helped Trump win. Did Russia bring in fake ballots? Did Russia write the software of the machines? Did Russia uh, validate the ballots? No. What are you accusing Russia of? Buying ads on Facebook to convince dumb Americans to vote for Trump? That's basically your argument. That's not, 
even if you, even if that argument is correct, and I don't believe that dumb Americans would listen to those to vote for Trump. Let me not let me let me not because uh, uh, let me not offend all Americans here, which is a ridiculous argument. Wasn't and then, it like fifteen people on social media posted ads or something crazy? Wasn't it? Right, but that's the thing. Like anyone is allowed to post ads. If Russia wants to post ads on Facebook because they would rather have one guy win over another, I don't understand where the crime is. Anyone can post ads. Facebook doesn't supposed to discriminate as to who pays for the ads as long as you know the ads aren't lying. So if Russia wants to spend their money because they think Trump is a better president, and guess what? I was actually in Russia in 2016, the day after the election. I, f- I happened to fly to Russia for unrelated reasons. And the Russian people were happy that Trump won. It wasn't malicious. They were happy for the American people that a businessman, someone with independent thinking, someone that's not a socialist won the election because they've spent 70 years under those regimes. So the Russian people were very happy for Americans that Trump got elected. And that's not malicious. So, but in any case, the votes themselves weren't fraudulent in 2016. The accusation was that they were convinced to vote a certain way. This time around, the actual voting is being challenged, that the voting was uh, faked, that votes were handed from one guy to another. This is not, they're not even in the same universe of potential uh, fraud between 2016 and 2020. So true. So true. I mean, I don't care if every voter puts an ad on Facebook to try to convince. That's fine. I don't care. But to change the votes, to take my vote and throw it away. There are actual people talking about, you know, that they were there that night and they threw away, you know, hundreds. I, I threw away hundreds of votes and he threw away, you know, a couple hundred vote. And, you know, we just took all those Trump votes and threw them away. You know what? How dare you? How dare you take a vote from an American citizen for the president of their country? and throw it away, burn it, destroy it away. How, would, how dare you touch it? I consider this to be treasonous. I really do. We laugh I about agree. it and we talk about it. I, I agree. I mean, I, I, and I would say the same thing if it was the other side. Uh, no matter how much I dislike the Biden, uh, Kamala Harris ticket uh, for president, if they legitimately won that election, I need to know that. Uh, because if they legitimately won that election, that probably gets me out of the country sooner. Uh, because I need to know what the honest vote was for me to make a proper assessment on where I will be spending the rest of my life. And, you know, how are we even going to tell a revote or recount? We're going to not revote, but recount this. Well, if all these votes are thrown away, you know, how, well, how at, dare these people? Well, at the least, you can look into the software of the machines um, literally, we, we, when we're doing the show, and we did another show the other day, you look at one county in Michigan where uh, in the last election with uh, 98% of the votes of residents in a certain county, uh, last year, uh, sorry, last election, it was about 7,500 to 8,000 votes for Trump and about 4,000 votes for Hillary. And this year, it was the opposite. It was seven and a half to 8,000 votes for Biden with 4,000 votes for Hillary. How do, sorry, for, uh, a, for Trump. Uh, how, like, that's a, like, how do you explain that? Are you saying 80% of the people in that county moved out and the opposite view, 80% of the people moved in? Like, how does it sway like that? How does one candidate win by doubling the margin and the four years later it flips to the in the opposite way it's with the all same the it's so obvious tone it's so obvious i mean and, and look at the trump rallies everyone loves him i'm sorry our country loves our president and that's the truth our mainstream media which is supposed to be journalism which is nothing more than pr it is advertisement for the democratic communist party who is now a hand in hand with the Chinese Communist Party in our country. And that's the truth. And so we've got all these rich people, these Hollywood people that want their you know, director job, the mainstream media and the politicians. That's it, mainstream PR service and, and the politicians. The rest of our country. 
it's ruining friendships. It's ruining relationships. Not that clearly the COVID and the lockdowns didn't do enough damage to the, uh, to human relationships between each other. Now it's this, it's, it's just getting bad. Yeah. Well, if there hadn't been the cheating, the obvious cheating, if it hadn't been so obvious, number one, you know what? I want our president to be elected by our country. And if that's our way, our country feels okay. But to know that and to have people so, it, it's just so mean and contemptuous the way they talk about they threw away the votes and, you know, and, you know, what we do have is whistleblowers. Just to wrap up this topic, we have, we actually have a video um, from a, a poll watcher that actually got in because she spoke Mandarin. She's an Asian American, but she, she doesn't, she looks like she's Asian. And so she got in and um, she was there from her shift was like 10 PM to, to I think 5 AM in the morning. They stopped counting tw- you know, right after 12 tone. I thought they stopped counting and put a halt on the States because Trump looked like he was going to win. And that was the situation. That's what it looked like. What she says is they stopped counting because the votes were done counted. They were counted. In Michigan, they were counted. So, you know, at 1230 or whatever, the, the, his win was a win in Michigan. And so what happened then, she sat there and waited for the next three hours. Everybody just sat there and waited. And then at 334 o'clock in the morning, there were vans, a van and two cars that pulled up with mounds and 63 boxes of votes just for Biden, votes just for Biden. No one saw them open, no one saw them counted, whatever. And the person announced, oh, we have, um, what she said was, we have 16,000 votes that just came in, but they're already counted. So everyone can go home in 20 minutes at 5 a.m. So she went home and then this was at the TCF Center in Detroit. Then she heard um, later that they had, um, and so, 7,000 were counted while she was there. 16 counted, I guess, pre-counted were added, 16,000. So um, what, you have 23,000 votes. It was announced that there were 120,000 votes that had been counted that night and that Biden had won by an extraordinary amount. I I mean, it's just ludicrous. It makes no sense. And, and here's like, the problem. What? First of all, I'm going to bring it back to Bitcoin. Like, thank God there's Bitcoin because it's the only thing that in the back of my mind says, you know what? I don't care. I don't care. A Bitcoin will at least save me. It's not going to save your country. Uh, it's not going to save this country, but it'll at least save me uh, and my family. Uh, so thank God there's Bitcoin. Uh, however, in that case, this is the problem. Like if she... Uh, as she starts, she wants to do the right thing. She wants to go public and she knows her life can actually get ruined. I mean, she can be getting, she's probably getting death threats. Uh, her family could be getting death threats. They could be legitimate death threats. Every inch of her history, her past life can be scrutinized. Everyone's going to be digging into it. Look, everyone has some things in their past they don't exactly want out there on uh, mainstream media, but they will do that to you. So it's very, very difficult to come forward and be honest about what's happening. And I actually applaud people that are willing to do that. Yeah. Without them, we really wouldn't know because the poll watchers were kept out. Um, in terms of Bitcoin, Tone, what is the most important thing for everybody to know right now? So for everyone to know right now is that for the past 10 years, the world has had uh, a currency that is politically neutral. And since we just spent the majority of the show talking about politics, uh, politics creates currency. All money, anything that every living person uh, has been using a government created and controlled currency. And it is actually kind of scary to even consider a currency that the government does not control. It is also really, really scary to think of a future with a one world currency, because we are so used to these dystopian nightmares of a one world government 
which I agree with, would be absolutely terrible. And a one world government would obviously have a one world currency. But in a world of a, in a future with a one world government controlling the currency, you are in a lot of trouble. But in this case, if this one global world currency is actually politically neutral, if no government, no person, no entity, no corporation, no matter how big, whether they're Google or whatever, has the ability to control that currency from where the transactions go, how much of that currency is in circulation, do you have the right to hold that currency? Uh, they don't have control of that. And this is one of the most powerful tools to lower uh, and lessen the reach of government for the next generation. And it's a combination of people not willing to believe that Bitcoin creates this uh, power to the ordinary citizen and also constant misinformation that someone has invented a better Bitcoin uh, the day after. Uh, no, they haven't. So uh, once you finally make this leap of, well, I don't want to say leap of faith, but once you finally make the scientific uh, proper decision that Bitcoin is a valuable tool that you should strongly consider, please do not get separated from that Bitcoin by stories of how you can get rich on some scam because everything else in the crypto space is then there's a 99% chance that anything else in the crypto space is actually a scam. There is a 1% chance that it's not, but you are assuming you know what that 1% is. Uh, meanwhile, Bitcoin is right there. So getting your hands on some Bitcoin is a huge step forward, but a harder step is to actually hold down to that Bitcoin because everyone will try to separate you from it. Uh, so that is probably the biggest lesson uh, that people need to learn. Right. And, and Bitcoin is going to cut into gold's uh, financial properties. Gold isn't very movable. Gold can, can no longer be used as a, uh, to, to take your money out of the country. Metal detectors have been around for a long time. Uh, you can't just you know, pack your gold into a suitcase and leave, but you can pack your Bitcoin onto a USB drive or even in your head and leave. So uh, Bitcoin is now uh, providing the properties that are better than gold when it comes to wealth and money. So uh, eventually Bitcoin will take over. Right, and amazing privacy properties that are look like they could be incredibly valuable going. Yeah, forward. they could be better, uh, but uh, it's uh, it's okay. But uh, hopefully, uh, those uh, privacy properties will get some upgrades over the next decade. Beautiful, beautiful, and we will be having you back soon within the next three to four months to really go through um, the technological aspects of the improvements of privacy for Bitcoin. I'm going to have you really lay out what the having actually is for new people and um, get into the nitty gritty of uh, Bitcoin. But for now, this has been, it's always amazing to have you here. Please tell our audience about your YouTube channel, your upcoming events, and how to follow your work. Sure. Uh, thank you so much for the interview, uh, Michelle. And uh, most of my content is free and available. It's on uh, youtube.com slash tone vase. Uh, basically, everything is under my name. Uh, Tonevase.com has a, a lot of information, including a free trading tutorial at tonevase.com. Um, uh, my, most of my following is on Twitter. Uh, also, tone base on Twitter, tone base on Instagram as well. Not, I don't do much over there. As for the events, uh, my the first event I ever put together is still happening in Las Vegas. It is called uh, Unconfiscatable. It's more of a general Bitcoin conference. Uh, you mentioned the technological side of Bitcoin, and I organized an event for that as well. That takes place in Europe, uh, specifically in Malta. And that event is called Understanding Bitcoin. 
there are YouTube videos. That's the event to go to to understand the, technolo the technology side of Bitcoin. A website for that is understandingbtc.com. And my final event that I organize is more for traders and hedge funds. Uh, there has only been one of them in Bali. We had to cancel it this year. I'm hoping to do it two or three times a year, Bali, the Caribbean, uh, and other destinations. It's, the website for that is thefinancialsummit.com. Uh, it's called The Financial Summit, and that's for traders and hedge funds. It's a small event, maximum 40 people, and it is designed for the successful trader, uh, the high net worth individual, and hedge funds. So, uh, the price on that event is a little bit higher than mo most conferences. Right, a little bit lofty. Something else I want to cover next time you're back is the entry of um, high net worth individuals, including hedge funds, the, um, the industry, the background, because from Wall Street, you can watch all of these actual um, typical hedge fund types come into Bitcoin and what that's going to do to the price, right? Oh, yeah. And uh, a lot of companies, I didn't even expect that. I did think that hedge funds would get in, but I did not expect that companies will now start investing their excess cash into Bitcoin, feeling that Bitcoin is a better investment than even their own stock. And we're seeing that with micro strategies already and Square. Uh, Square is totally understandable because the CEO of Square has been a big Bitcoin uh, fan for a while, uh, but MicroStrategy is investing billions of dollars into Bitcoin, specifically saying that they saw it as a better investment than buying back their own stock. That is uh, very impressive. And uh, if a few more companies do that, uh, it's going to become, well, every company now has to do it because otherwise you're losing your competitive advantage because with every company that puts in a few billion dollars into the Bitcoin uh ecosystem, you raise the price of Bitcoin. So each company that was there before now becomes more and more valuable. And it now becomes strategic to own Bitcoin uh, or your competitors will take you out, uh, which is an awesome dynamic and certainly helps those that already have a few Satoshis. Right. They'll have to invest just to keep up with their competition. Otherwise, they're just going to be left behind. So it's going to become, these are going to be very, this is going to be an amazing decade. I think, for Bitcoin. And we will have you back soon. It's always so great to have you here. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. All right. Uh, let's see. Hopefully next time I'm on a show, uh, COVID is in the history books. But if it's not, uh, we're going to have to talk a little bit about that insanity as well. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, oh. I'm, I'm sure you've covered it over the last year. But I uh, want to hear your take. I want to hear your take. You have such a global point of view. You know what I mean? Um, and... Also, coming from the Bitcoin standpoint, you also right. have a unique and being a trader. My take yeah. on COVID is very, very simple. Uh, do I think COVID is real? Of course. Uh, do I think uh, it can kill some people? Of course. Uh, do I think that the world economy should have been destroyed and uh, way more people are going to be depressed for the rest of their life. Like, like some people actually losing the next 50 years of their life uh, in order to extend someone's life by six months because they were old and unhealthy. And I think this is disastrous uh, for humans in general. Uh, I think the threat of uh, health in COVID was a little overblown, uh, but the reaction to COVID by uh, the people that like to rule other people has been uh, beyond what anyone could have imagined that actually believes in life and freedom. Absolutely. Absolutely. This, honestly, Tone, it's the flu. It's the flu. You know, coronavirus is the flu. There's thousands of kinds of coronaviruses. They just call this COVID-19, I think, because it was started in 2019. I don't know whether it was plan to be started in 2019 or not, but there haven't been 19 flus. There have been a thousand of them. It's coronavirus and the people that are dying are the people that would die naturally from the flu. And you know what's really interesting? Hundreds of thousands of people die from the flu every year, Tone. It's a very dangerous because it has no cure, but hardly anybody has died from the flu over the past year 
the same number of people died from COVID-19. So. Right, but also uh, the statistics on people dying from the flu are very small, and some like to make the argument, well, this is because we're all doing social distancing and wearing masks, and that's why no one is catching and dying from the flu. And my answer to them is, so how come we didn't do this 20 years ago when the flu was discovered, and how come we didn't lock ourselves down and not allowed to fly and not allowed to leave our home for the last 20 years? Shouldn't that have been the solution? Right, right. It's just, it's the flu. It's just being called COVID-19 this year. Um, this has been a disastrous. It's been horrific for the lives of everyone. And it looks like it's getting worse. And uh, this is just crazy times. Tone, I look forward to having you back probably within the next 90 days as this goes forward. Uh, yes, uh, please reach out. Happy to come back and do a little bit of an update. Hopefully we'll know who the president is yes. in 90 days. Because if we don't know who the president is, by default, it becomes Nancy Pelosi, which is going to be incredible. And that's probably what America deserves because she's third in line. <laughs> oh, we can't even, <laughs> can't even go there. <laughs> Tone. Mr. Tone Vase, financial commentator, Bitcoin expert, trader and teacher for the Cryptocurrencies Future of Digital Money show. I'm Michelle Holliday at Portfolio Wealth Global dot com.